Welcome to this briefing. Whether you're a bishop who's going to be attending the conference or a journalist covering it or another interested party, we're delighted to have you here. Um, I'm sorry I'm rather muted in shade. I had to move at the last minute to get my Wi-Fi, but given the heat, it's probably as well, but you can't quite see me. Um, particularly thanks to those of you who are getting up early or staying up late to join us. And the format for the discussion is that um, I will go to our guests in turn and ask a couple of questions from each of them before opening up the floor to your questions and comments. Um, there's an awful lot to discuss, so if I interrupt you or seek to move the discussion on, forgive me, um, it's just that I want to get around as many people as possible. Um, do put your questions and comments into the chat box or raise your hand and I will get to as many as you as possible. Now, um, the conference starting in a week's time. Um, the theme of the conference is God's Church for God's World. Um, I want to go first of all to uh, Bishop Emma Einson, who's the Bishop to the Archbishops of Canterbury and York. Um, Bishop Emma, uh, the bishops come to Lambeth at the invitation of the Archbishop of Canterbury, but it is the bishops conference. Um, and they will no doubt set their agenda as, as we go. But can you um, give us some indication of the scale of work that's been done by the design group and by the Archbishop of Canterbury um, to ensure that the agenda before them is indeed the bishop's agenda? Mm. Thank you, Rosie, and hi, everybody. Really good to see you. Thank you so much for joining us today. Yes, I can't believe um, that the conference starts uh, so soon next week because it does feel like it's been a very long time coming. Um, and uh, you're, you're right, it's been a long time in the planning. So many of you will know that when Archbishop Justin uh, took over as Archbishop of Canterbury, um, what he did first of all was to visit all of the provinces. So he, I can't remember how many, but it spent years visiting every private um, and just talking and listening um, and working out what people's agenda was and, and just wanting to get to a place where people were wanting to meet together and willing to, to meet together. Um, so that the, the conference that given that the two, 10 yearly span would have been in 2018 was postponed till 2020. Um, and then we all know what happened then and COVID hit. And so now it's been postponed even further to 2022. So although it's been delayed, I think that time has been put to really good use, both in the way that Archbishop Justin has developed relationships and, you know, really deep relationships and friendships, actually, around the communion. And also with the work the design group's been doing. So when the conference was postponed from 2020 to 2022, we thought, well, we can either just sit here and twiddle our thumbs for, for two years or we can get on and start the conference. So in a way, it's already started bishops have been meeting in groups of around 20 with people from across the communion so not not with the people in their own little circle but getting to know people from across the whole communion on zoom uh, for two hours uh, every month last year and just talking about the really important topics that are on the ground for us in our different contexts so you know as, as we come to the physical meeting next week really that's building on on the back of a whole load of virtual um, and and relational work that's been happening over the last few years um and as the conference starts those private conversations i mean there will be private conversations at lambeth but it all happens sort of in the glare of the worldwide church and uh, publicity and so on um we've had statements in the last couple of weeks from the global south, global south fellowship of anglican churches calling for the conference to reaffirm resolution 110 from the 1998 conference which lays down the official position of the anglican communion on human sexuality I don't suppose that's quite what the Archbishop and the design group needed, you know, with just over a week to go to the conference. Um, does the agenda have enough flexibility in it for this issue to be dealt with as fully as some people clearly want it to be? Yeah, um, we, we hope so. I mean, obviously, people will be coming with all sorts of different expectations and some of them conflicting and actually competing you know I, th I think we are kidding ourselves if we think that by the end of two weeks time we'll all sort of skip away happily through the daisies and everything will be sweetness and light you know the, this is a conferring of bishops and and when any group of Christians come together uh, they will disagree and they won't all see things in the same way um, you will you will notice that what we're calling the Lambeth calls have been published today um, so do please go to the Lambeth conference website and get a copy of those if 
you'd like to see what they involve. But that whole process, and we can, we can, you know, my colleague Bishop Anthony and others might want to chip in on this, is a chance for us to say, okay, these are some of the things that we, we think as an Anglican comedian, and it'll be on a diversity of uh, topics. So, you know, really important topics like uh, global warming, climate change, poverty, vaccine equity, discipleship, witness, you know, a whole load of different things. There'll be a chance for us to talk about what Anglicans believe, what they've always believed, uh, what some of the issues are today. And then we're really hoping that there will be a forward facing uh, view to those calls so that there won't just be, you know, we won't just talk shop and go home, but there will be actions for the God, the good of the world that will come out of it. The, the theme of this conference is God's church for God's world. And that's always been our guiding light, really. This is about what God's church does for God's world. Thank you. Um, Bishop Anthony Pogo, and you're the Secretary General Designate of the Anglican Communion and a Bishop from South Sudan. You're going to be chairing the session on Anglican identity. Um, when your appointment was announced, you raised it as the key challenge as well as that um, of human sexuality, which the um, Communion has to address. Apart from the issue of human sexuality for the moment, what are the other differences within the Communion that make this question of identity a contested one? Thank you very much, Rosie. I, I think one of the the, the 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 issues that has come up is the the, the fact that to, to be an Anglican, you have to be in communion with the Sea of Canterbury. There there are there are those who are contesting that, and with with the view that 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 should not should not be the case. Um, now I, that's one of the, the the things that 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 has come up. Um, no, of course, if there was a need for, for that to be changed, then yes, that, that has to come through the normal structures of the within the Anglican Communion, the instruments of the Anglican Communion, then conversations could, could happen. So that was the reason why I raised raised, raised that that raised that, that 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 matter. But the reality, of course, is that the Anglican Communion is a communion of provinces that are autonomous uh, but interdependent. And so, uh, although uh, you, you have to be in communion with the city of Canterbury, the Archbishop of Canterbury is first among equals. He he does not have any executive or legislative authority over any other province other than his own, and and, and so that's 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 I think an important uh, uh, factor there. I mean, Archbishop Justin said at a recent conference, you know, we we've got our differences, but um, we're all united in the love of Jesus. I mean. The, that's not enough, really, is it, um, for to claim an Anglican identity? Yeah, well, th th that's not enough. But, but, however, I think what 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 unites us is our love of, of Jesus Christ. Because without without Jesus Christ, you know, then we who are we? I think as as a church, the significance of following Jesus Christ is important. We are all baptized, baptized in the name of Christ, and so we. We we can't ignore that important fact, and I think that that is something that we we, we need to remember at all times. Uh, we are baptized. Uh, we are we belong to this family of, of people who are united by by the love of Jesus Christ, by the baptism that we all we all we, we we've all been baptized, uh, you know, to, to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Thank you, um, Archbishop Sami Shihata. Um, you're the Archbishop of a rather large province, um, Egypt and the north of Africa. Thank you very much for joining us today. It's good to have you with us. Um, I wonder if I can ask you um, simply to start with about the Anglican, the value of the Anglican Communion and the Lambeth Conference from where you sit. You're in an environment where you know you're a minority religion in a relatively small church. Um, what, what's, the, what's the value of the Lambeth Conference and the Anglican Communion for you? Yes, thank you so much for your invitation. It's great to be uh, with you. I think I've been Anglican all my life and uh, I value the Anglican way. And uh, yes, we are not so big in number in, uh, in Egypt, uh, yet we have our uh, very fruitful and influential ministry in the country. Uh, we have many ministries with the Islamic community in the kind of dialogue we have, and uh, we have good relationship with Al-Azhar. Uh, we do initiatives to bring young people, uh, sheikhs and priests together to discuss. Uh, we serve the community in general. Our mission in Egypt is a living church for a better society. So our mission is to be a living church. Church is uh, alive, 
uh, with the power of the Holy Spirit. And yet this church is alive to change uh, the society. And this is the vision for uh, many years to come in the Anglican church. I, I guess there are many um, small, smaller churches who sometimes wonder um, about the preoccupations of, the, of some members of the Anglican Communion and, and what they are. But um, my understanding is that you, you have something as a role of a mediator in some of the debates within the Anglican Communion. And I, I need to put to you that your predecessor, Archbishop Munir, has just published a letter basically saying that a broken Anglican Communion can't deal with the brokenness of the world and again referring to the debate over human sexuality and the need, as he believes it, for the um, affirmation of Lambeth 110. How do you, how do you negotiate with, with these different sort of voices um, in, where, where you are? I think that this question about negotiation is uh, very important because we're not really in a state of negotiation. Um, we as a province of Alexandria have signed on the ecclesial, enhancing ecclesial unity, and uh, we signed on a declaration of faith, which states very clearly resolution 110 of Lambeth. So we're not in the discussion really of, uh, of this. We're part of the Anglican communion as long as the Anglican communion uh, is orthodox, uh, traditional church. And this is, we're really going to Lambeth, the global south, and uh, we are praying and uh, networking. Uh, been interesting to be um, involved in this instrument of unity or instrument of communion as we come together as the Archbishop of Canterbury and all the bishops and the primates in uh, one place. Thank you. I don't think Bishop Joseph is with us, is he yet? Joseph Ondera from Kenya, or is he? I'm just looking across. Um, if anybody sees him, can you alert me in the chat box, please? Um, I'm going to go to Bishop Eugene Sutton now, who is from Maryland in the US. Um, if you'd like to unmute yourself, Bishop, good to see you. Thank you for getting up early for us. Um, now, you've just had your general convention of the Episcopal Church in the United States, and the, the key call that you made um, was around the environment. Um, we're expecting temperatures to be records for temperatures to be broken in the UK today. Um, can I ask you what what can the Lambeth Conference do in addressing um, that question, that call that you have made um, beyond beyond words? Uh, yes. Good morning. Thank you. It is early here. Uh, yes, we did make a, made statements on care for God's creation. But the specific call I made was care for God's creation in terms of humans. I talked about, I emphasized racial justice and what can we do to redress the wrongs of the past. What are the things that the, perhaps the US can help contribute to the Anglican communion is an ability to, uh, to confess the faith, the faith of Christ and to be in unity with our brothers and sisters who disagree on various tenets of that faith. I'm of African descent in America. And of course, in our history, Anglicans helped lead the way in enslaving my ancestors, stealing from them, stealing their lives, stealing their livelihoods. We know that is against the tenets of Christianity. It is against Christ. And yet um, our African Anglican forebears did not separate themselves from the church because of, of um, promulgating that sin. I think there's a learning here. Do we really have to agree on all issues in order for the world to say, ah, they are followers of Christ? I believe in, of course, in the Gospel of John, John 17, where Jesus on the last evening, the last night of his earthly journey, had one thing in mind, especially for his disciples, that they may be one, that they may love one another. I pray that you may be one as the Father and I are one, I and him, he and me, and they and us, that they may all be, be, may be one, so that the world may believe that you sent me. Why should the world believe in Jesus Christ if, if the world sees that those Christians of one family will not even get together? And so the Anglican communion is a communion of love. If we do not get love right, we don't get anything right. And I believe the Anglican communion can be a mediating force in the world for how to hold on tra to tradition on the one hand, but to be open to the new on the other. 
Well, that, that's the hope for the conference um, by, by the organisers and all those attending, I'm sure. I mean, we have to note that the bishops of Rwanda, Nigeria and Uganda are boycotting the conference and, and several um, others are too. I'm just checking again that uh, Bishop Joseph isn't here from, from Kenya because I would have liked to have asked him about um, his church's position. He, he will be coming. Um, I'm sure we'll return to this question about um, what the Archbishop has called um, good disagreement and, and how it might be achieved. Um, but I just want to go to um, Eve Parker, um, who is the Director of Global Mission at um, USPG, um, Mission Society in, um, in the UK. Um, Eve, now this is a ridiculous question in a way because it's just so broad, but um, in the engagement that you have had with Anglican churches worldwide, um, and in this question of sort of um, achieving Anglican identity, I wonder what are some of the issues that you find people are preoccupied, you know, not in not not as, not as bishops, but as as lay people, um, development workers, clergy, and so on. Thanks, Ruby. I think right now um, many Christians around the world in local churches are simply struggling to survive day to day in the midst of extreme poverty, the repercussions of climate change, a global pandemic, war, violence, religious persecution. And so whilst many Christians that might on the ground might not be aware of how important the Lambeth Conference is, it still matters greatly to all Anglicans, I think, because in terms of an identity, because the Lambeth Conference is this opportunity for those who hold the power in the Anglican Church to be true witnesses to these global injustices. And as Bishop Eugene just mentioned about racial justice too, that has to be at the forefront of the conversations right now. Um, I think it's a, a situation where we've got to show solidarity and, and this is an opportunity to gather as a collective in the face of such realities and actively work for a better future. So I'm hoping that it will be um, a space where people listen and learn and honest dialogue can happen because we've all gone through this global pandemic but some nations have been significantly harder hit and we can see this in the increasing levels of economic inequality around the world so from, from USPG's perspective we've been working closely with many of the primates that will be at Lambeth um, and many have been working on issues of migration, climate change, poverty, and gender inequality. And this is shaping the ministry within the different regions. And these are the issues that matter enormously to the future of the Anglican church. So I am I'm very much in hope that this will be an opportunity to overcome divisions. Um, um, we, we hear um, some criticism sometimes from um, bishops about colonial attitudes of the Western church. I, I think um, in, where I hear it is in terms of adopting or Im imposing agendas that they see as liberal. But I, I wonder if there's anything that you would say about the wider question of um, decolonizing church and mission and how that impacts Anglican identity. Um, I think people have different ideas about what decolonizing is and what it means for the church and her mission. Um, but the most important thing is to recognize that the church, particularly the Anglican church has a history and a history that is extremely complex, but also one that is interconnected with the expansion of the British Empire. And the British Empire sought to colonize not just land, but also bodies and minds. And I think the Anglican church played a significant role in this, particularly in terms of Christian mission and through education. And so I think the, the subject of decolonizing hopefully will also be central to some of the dialogue that takes place because it's about addressing the history of the Anglican Church, her mission, and it's about touching on subjects that sometimes people don't want to talk about, like the subject of reparations. And it's about challenging the dynamics of power that continue to exist today. And this is apparent in the continued racism we're witnessing around the world. So I think decolonizing in the context of Lambeth will therefore be critical in terms of looking at dynamics of power in particular. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to um, ask for uh, questions now. Um, if you're a journalist or indeed anyone who wants to ask a question, please um, um, indicate that you wish to do so and I will come to you. Um, I'm just going to go um, to Jonathan Peter, um, who's um, a veteran journalist like so many of us um, and uh, has attended um, uh, Lambeth conferences in the past. Um, there, there are all the private discussions that go on behind the scenes. There are then um, the sort of the calls, the 
historically the resolutions, the statements. Um, as, a, as a journalist, um, how, how do you reflect on the, the, the conferences that you, you um, attended in the past and the sort of the, the journey that the stories then went on afterwards in a way? They, they ran away with themselves, didn't they? Or um, can, can you just have, uh, give us a few reflections on that? Yes, I think my first Lambeth conference was back in 1988 when um, Archbishop Robert Runcie was uh, presiding. And um, uh, that conference, I think, they wrestled with the issue of uh, whether individual churches went ahead with women bishops, how that would um, could fracture the unity of the communion. But they came up with a compromise and possibly that compromise um, gave people the feeling that they could come up with compromises on other issues. And of course, on the issue of homosexuality, the next conference, that didn't, uh, didn't play. Um, and that's been a, a sort of, you know, major fissure down the uh, communion ever since. Um, in terms of how we as the press have dealt with, with uh, Lambeth conferences, I mean, I, I think uh, we've treated them pretty seriously. Uh, it may be that people participating may have been irritated that we seem to be fixated on one or two issues, which is about splits and schisms uh, to the detriment of other things. But when we're there, we find that that's the conversations where, when we talk to bishops and participants, that's basically what they are all interested in as well. And it is the, the big overarching um, issue that that's still there and I think that um, obviously this conference is uh, slightly trying to manage that in the sense that um, the, the resolutions are no longer there uh, and what I think people took the resolutions to be a sort of moral authority so that if they were passed no one thought they were legally binding but they were supposedly morally binding and that when people who voted on, the, on, uh, on them went back to their own countries, they wouldn't reverse them straight away. And I think that's what caused the huge shock waves that um, they were reversed quite quickly. Um, and the att attempts to repair that tear in the communion, particularly by uh, Archbishop Rowan Williams and, and the Covenant and, and things like that have, have floundered. So we, we're at a sort of state where we're not quite sure what the, communion means and whether there is a and what the status of the split is um, people haven't formally split in the sense of breaking off communion with the archbishop of canterbury but it seems to a lot of us in the press that there is a de facto split there and uh, that how, how far that can be if you like papered over um, by man the management of the this this lambeth conference and having calls not resolutions and things like that is, is you know, we wait to see. Uh, thank you. Um, is there a bishop who would like to um, respond to that? Otherwise, I'll go to another question. But um, um, Bishop Anthony, would you like to respond to that? I think to perhaps by give an example, I, I was at the 2008 Lambeth Conference and Bishop Eugene and I were in the same Ndaba group. And, and we, we, in our group, there were many things that we were discussing, very many you know, positive things, uh, sharing our, our own experiences from our different dioceses. Uh, and of course, as uh, Jonathan rightly said, you know, uh, often uh, the press is interested in the issues that, 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 that are perhaps uh, would form better headlines, but otherwise a lot happened. Um, not only that, after the conference, uh, many of us in that group uh, have, have built relationship friendships. I, uh, I think I've, I've, I've been to Maryland, uh, you know, Twice now, and I think in one in one one of those visits, I've, I've been to Bishop Eugene. I will build that relationship because of the fact that we were together, you know, in 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 that in that in, that, in the conference. I think the other important thing to, to say is that out of the Lambeth Conference, companion relationships are also built, and and people continue to have this relationship. The Anglican Communion is a family. Now, a lot happens in that family. Of course, like any other family, there are, there are, there are issues of uh, you know, relationships, issues of there are disputes, 
Uh, but there are a lot of things that happen. And like my colleague Bishop Emma said at the beginning, we're looking at this Lambeth conference to be sharing, you know, stories of what is happening in our, our province, but also with the issue that, are, that the world is facing. So that we, we look at these issues, climate change, issues of, of poverty, issues of uh, conflicts, um, you know, uh, all these are issues that really, really, really import, are, are important. And so I, I thought I should, uh, this, this would be my response. Thank you. I, I suppose that the problem is if, if there are some people who can't attend because they feel that they can't be in the same room with people who disagree with them on human sexuality or others who um, want to make this, this the key issue of the conference, then um, it, does, it does present you with um, a problem, doesn't it? But let me move on to Mark Michael, who's got a question, I think, uh, for Bishop Eugene. Uh, Mark Michael, would you just introduce yourself, please? Yes, Mark Michael, um, the editor of The Living Church uh, based in the US. I, I'm Bishop Eugene's neighbor, more or less. We live a, uh, maybe a half an hour away from each other. Um, uh, Bishop Eugene, you were very humble about what you said at, at General Convention last week. You, you, Bishop Eugene gave a really stirring sermon calling the Episcopal Church to, to tear down the walls um, and to really repair the breaches related to past racial injustices and, and lifted up some wonderful work that has been unfolding in his diocese over the last several years. And, and I guess my question to you is, um, the Episcopal Church's relationship uh, to, you know, the, the evils of colonialism is, is not perhaps um, as central to its identity as some other provinces, but it's still there. And you are going to the Lambeth Conference as as someone who comes from the world's wealthiest, most powerful nation. And I'm just curious if you feel there is a call and, and also from a church whose own actions have been at the heart of a lot of the divisions that are plaguing us. And I'm just wondering if there's a way, if you feel a call to repair the breach um, as a leader of that church to tear down some of these walls and how we how that can be done in a humble, gracious way, um, coming out of some of the same things that you talked about so powerfully last Sunday. Yes, Michael, um, uh, thank you. By the way, at his church, I gave my first confirmations as bishop when he was in Maryland. Tearing down the walls, uh, uh, yes, we have to do that with humility, uh, which is to say, uh, as, as sure as we think we are about several issues, we all have to be humble and, and saying, we don't really know if we 100% have the mind of Christ in every issue. The church has changed its mind over the years, over a number of issues. And so um, coming to Lambeth for me, I do hope to be uh, a mediating force. I committed my life to Jesus Christ at 17 years old. Uh, uh, because of the evangelism work of people in my high school. And we're still trying to do that in Maryland. I call myself an evangelical. I believe that the biggest crisis in the Episcopal Church today is not money or sexuality. It, it's a lack of confidence in the power of the gospel to change people's lives and institutions. I love talking with my fellow evangelical brothers and sisters and those in the Anglo-Catholic tradition. And yet we disagree about some issues. What does it say though, if someone doesn't want to sit down with me because of my views on certain issues of human sexuality? It says that they, um, that they consider the value of their opinion to be a greater value than they and me sitting, to sitting down and communing together. I think what it says, Bishop, isn't it, is that they see, um, that issue oh, oh, uh, as, as not one of opinion, but of salvation. That if you believe um, certain views about human sexuality, you are or are not going to heaven. I mean, it's, it's that important, it's that significant, and therefore it's very, very difficult to see in a way what good disagreement can possibly look like. I, I, uh, thank you, that's a very good point. Again, I go into the history and the history of my people. When the slave master enslaved us, 
that's a matter of life and death. And they did it in the name of Christ and they killed us. They demeaned us, they oppressed us. And yet we, by and large, did not say, we will reject being in your church because of your views. That was a matter of life and death to us. So I, 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 do, I do know we have deeply held um, views on what the scriptures mean for us in our day, in our context. But let's get together. Let's talk about this. We may or may not agree, but can we not sit at the table with one another? And if you believe that because of my views that I am not fit for heaven, um, okay, maintain that view. But I in turn will say, why don't we study the scriptures together? Why don't we pray together? Because that's what commune means. That's what love means. Thank you very much, Bishop. Um, Bishop Emma, I think you have your hand up. Yeah, I, I just wanted to come in there and building on what Bishop Eugene said about studying the scriptures together. What the book of the Bible that the bishops are going to be studying together when we're um, together in, in the Lambeth Conference is First Peter. And just following on from that previous conversation, I, I'm really grateful that only God gets to decide who is a Christian or not, because um, I think that's a really big responsibility if anybody takes that on. But there's a verse in 1 Peter that says, always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. That's what we're going to be doing as we meet together, yet do it with gentleness and respect. So I think that, you know, it's both of those things, being able to give a reason for why we believe the things we do, some of them crucial and fundamental to our faith, but also doing that with gentleness and respect. So I think that that sort of verse and that sort of attitude, I hope, will be our guiding light uh, as we come together. Thank you. Um, can we go to Jim McManus? Um, Jim, um, you've got a question. Do, do tell us where you're from. Yes. Hi, it's John McManus, actually, Rosie. Oh, I'm Hi. sorry, John. <laughs> That's all right. I'm actually head of media for the Jesuits, so I don't have any skin in this game at all. But having reported um, on various Anglican stories over the years when I was a BBC journalist, I do like to still keep across. Apologies for the sweat, obviously. I'm trying to keep cool in this heat wave. Um, yeah, one of the things that struck me, for those who aren't in the UK who are Zooming into this meeting, um, we're going through a period where lots of people are questioning just how representative our political leaders are, whether they really understand what it's like for the, for the ordinary person across the country who's struggling with bills, who's worried about what's going to happen uh, this coming autumn when, when, for example, energy bills are going, going to go up and who's pretty frightened about, about what's about to come. And one of the reoccurring things we hear is, do political leaders really represent those who vote for them or, or who might be persuaded to vote for them? And, and in some ways, that, that's, I think, a problem with any huge bureaucracy. So thinking about that, I'm just wondering if, if this Lambeth Conference is really in touch, if its leaders are really in touch with what ordinary Christians on the ground are thinking, not just the ones who stand up and make a lot of noise or, and do a lot within their local churches and are very um, um, obvious and, and visible, but also those who just get on with being a Christian but get on with their normal lives as well. Do, do they really represent those Christians? Do they know what they're thinking? I think as bishops living in the community, we really uh, see how people are struggling with so many issues. And the last thing we want is to be divided. The question is not to study the scripture. I think the question is, are we in communion? Uh, we do scripture reasoning with Muslims. Uh, we read the scripture and they read the Quran and we discuss both ideas. And we do not disagree because we talk from our point of view and we're friends at the end of the kind of reasoning we do. Though we are so different from different religions, but the question is, are we in communion? Are we united? Do we believe the same thing? Uh, that's the big question. I think the Anglicans in Egypt and North Africa uh, uh, were really looking for um, good conference when we do a good networking. And uh, they're not interested in, in this sexuality problem. Uh, we're not cause, cause of this problem. And we are reacting to what happened some years ago. And we're really hoping that we continue in unity and we be part, continue to be part, full part of the Anglican communion. Thank you. Um, 
We haven't got Ryan, Toby, Cloto on the call, have we? Or Petrina Pacoe, because they were two people that were going to come on and actually sort of talk about being Anglicans in churches um, on the ground and what, and what their concerns were, but I, I don't see them um, with us. Um, can I go to um, Andrew Brown for a question, please? Like uh, Jonathan Peter, I am a um, bottle-scarred veteran of these conferences. Um, and what I remember is that in 1988, we took the view that the resolutions mattered, uh, that what was decided here would be, what was decided there would be binding on the relevant churches. Um, so decisions were taken and um, as I remember it, the American church simply went ahead and ordained a woman bishop, um, despite this being clearly not what the conference had wanted. Uh, in 1998, um, well, it just broke up, really. I mean, the decisions, the decisions were taken, but nobody even pretended that they were going to um, they were going to accept them if they disagreed with them. That was the problem about sexuality, and we're still there. So from the point of view of a journalist, it's difficult to justify uh, a gathering, spending vast attention on a gathering whose decisions are not even going to be accepted by the member churches. This, of course, is why we have calls instead of decisions. Um, however, there are some stuff in these calls which I think is worth um, worth looking at, and I'm absolutely fascinated um, by the talk about um, reparation. Um, there is there is towards I think it's the eighth call. Uh, there is uh, uh, a new body, the Anglican Communion, something or other. Will establish, I'm quoting here, will establish and publish holistic theologies of redemptive action and reparation. We call upon the Archbishop of Canterbury, as chair of the Church Commissioner's Board of Governance, to ensure that this theology shapes the Commissioner's response to the Church's links to colonialism and slavery. Um, this reads to me as if somebody thinks the Church Commissioners should be paying reparations for slavery. Have I misread it? I wouldn't want to comment on, on the detail of that. As I say, the calls document only came out this morning. Um, I think there are all sorts of suggestions, all sorts of um, possible ways of responding to each one of the calls that each of the provinces is going to uh, look at, have to look at in its own way, in its own context. The Church of England is already looking at the very, very carefully and very seriously at the issue of racial justice um, and various proposals are being put forward that um, you know, General Synod will consider over the next few years. So, so there may well be some actions coming out of these calls for the Church of England, but they will they will need to be differently interpreted interpreted in different regions. Bishop Anthony, have you got anything to add to that? Not really, but to add that the 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 what has been published these are the draft calls, and the bishops are are going to be discussing them when when they when they when they meet at the conference and so yes it would not be appropriate for me to respond to very specific matters that have been raised uh, but i agree with my colleague bishop emma that is why i spoke last week on tearing down the walls um that is an old testament um, um tenet that we need to repair the damage of the past when we talk about decolonization one of the ways that we can get past that is for the Western church and the colonizers to acknowledge their wrong and then to make amends for it. So I, I consider the call of reparations as one of repairing that which is still broken. And if we do not do that, uh, we are hardly followers of Christ. I wonder, Eve Parker, have you got um, anything to say on this question? I mean, it seems to me that there's a, a call from the the global church on the Church of England um, to um, to to um, address reparations. I mean, you're working in different parts of the communion with with people um, affected by obviously the his historic legacy of slavery. I mean, what what um, what do you think the Anglican Communion should be doing on this? So we've been looking quite a lot at the subject of decolonizing and the subject of reparations, particularly with um, the church in the Caribbean. Um, but one of the things that keeps coming up in terms of the dialogues is reparations of knowledge as well. 
and the role that theological education can play. So I'm hoping that there will be interesting conversations in response to the subject of reparations in what the Anglican communion can do in terms of addressing how better theological education for those in training for ministry can look at subjects to do with reparations, reconciliation, church history, but church history that really looks at the facts of colonialism as well and what that means for in terms of the colonization of the mind in terms of when the Christian missions literally took over education systems and said this is one way of thinking what that means for theology today and how that can relate to theological education in context around the world that's one of the things we're looking at we have a big symposium in Botswana coming up in November that will be addressing some of these issues but it'll be really good to hear more about what's happening in other parts of the communion. Um, Julia Bicknell, um, you've got your hand up, I have had for a long time, sorry to keep you waiting. Hi Rosie, thank you very much. So um, I'm just interested, I'm just scanning through the calls and I notice um, the call on interfaith relations and last week I was a delegate at the um, freedom, the, the ministerial on freedom of religion or belief. Obviously, there are many countries um, and uh, our bishop from Egypt will know this, where often a call for reconciliation or interfaith relations comes against a real backdrop of minority discrimination and oppression. So I'd just be interested to know um, which part of the conference will be addressing this issue and um, yeah, just a little bit more background about what is hoped to be achieved out of that, thanks. For fear of play, playing football with this, I really think Bishop Sammy should come in on this since this is very relevant to, to his, um, to, you know, to his context. But I, the, the issue of persecuted Christians will be will be addressed at several places, I think, not just in in one session, partly because some of the bishops will be coming from areas where they experience persecution. So they will be, the bishops from Pakistan will be bringing their, their church with them and their context with them. So I, I don't think it's just a matter of saying, well, persecuted Christians slot here. You know, I, I, I really hope that, that that will be throughout the whole conference because that's a lived experience with a lot of people. Um, but Bishop Sammy might want to comment further. Bishop Sammy? Yes, uh, I was in the same conference. And uh, it was great to be there and listening to people from all over the world, especially in Britain, talking about religious freedom or belief. Uh, we have many challenges in Egypt. And what I expect from Lambeth Conference is to be supported as Christian living in the Middle East, having many challenges, uh, to be supported by the communion in, in everyday struggles we have uh many challenges and i do believe that we have many bridges with the muslim community we building good relations we meet every day and i was able to meet ministers from egypt attending the conference and build a relationship and network with some people who i'm going to meet in egypt as a result of the conference so it has been wonderful experience and positive experience thank you um susie leaf um you have your hand up um please um, introduce yourself and uh, ask the question. Uh, hi, apologies that I'm uh, not on screen. Um, I'm actually sitting uh, in a cafe and I'm on my mobile phone, so you'll just see my ear. Um, I hope uh, my, my name's Susie Leaf. Um, I work um, in the Church of England. I'm attending Lambeth as a freelance journalist for the Christian Today and Evangelicals Now. Um, a question that's sort of been buzzing around quite a bit has been the question of the not inviting the same sex, the bishops who are in same sex relationships, their spouses. Um, it, how big an issue is that? I suppose there's going to be 600 or something um, bishops at the conference. Do we know how many people are affected by that? How many spouses will be missing? Um, Bishop Emma, do you know? Um, I think it's changing all the time because people are appointed all the time. I think it's about six people, six or seven people that this applies to. And there's certainly a couple of bishops who are who are not coming in solidarity with 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 those um, with those spouses. Um, Susie, do you want to ask anything else in relation to that? Uh, no, that's fine. That's lovely. Thank you. That's really helpful. Um, Harry, Harry Farley from the BBC. Thanks, Rosie. So apologies. I'm also off camera because I'm uh, joining from the cafe. Um, 
just a, quite a follow up sort of on that issue of, of sexuality. Obviously, we've got the calls, not the resolutions. I wonder whether you, um, can we expect any of the calls to focus explicitly on um, the debate within the end union on sexuality? Uh, and if so, um, can you give us any indication of, of what the nature of that call will be? Um, yeah, can, can you sort of a, a address whether there, there will be sort of any direct call on, on sexuality and particularly will it sort of make reference to obviously the, uh, the last call on Lambert Guantan? Um, I'm going to go back to Ruth Peacock actually because I think she had the call in front of her and she, she raised it earlier. Um, Ruth, can you just, uh, if you've got that, can you just tell us again what that call says? Because they, they have only been published this morning. Yeah, just just scanning through it, Harry, and um, the 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 words that I've got in front of me are um, prejudice on the basis of gender or sexuality threatens human dignity. There is disagreement. Uh, yet um, it is the mind of the Anglican Communion as a whole that same gender marriage is not permissible. Lambeth Resolution One Ten states, and it it states it. It's also the mind of the Communion that all baptised believing and faithful persons. Um, are to be welcomed, cared for, and treated with respect. So what, what I was saying earlier was it, it, that that bar on same-sex marriage uh, ha, shows that there's been no shift. Um, I know we went on to talk about reparation, but I, I wonder if anyone, particularly um, our bishop from America, has any reflection on that? Because, you know, bishops are in same-sex marriages, and it's a very live issue here in the UK. Yeah. I think also, I mean, after perhaps Bishop Eugene spoke, and maybe um, Bishop Emma, I mean, I, I suppose my question is, when is a call not a resolution? I mean, it's a call which is telling us what the resolution was. Um, what, what's the difference, really? Um, so, um, if we go to Bishop Eugene first. Yes, um, uh, well, I do not believe that the Anglican Communion is essentially a legislative body. It is not a, a judicial body. It is a communion. And I do not believe personally that it is best to think of communion as agreement or in resolutions. Uh, that's, uh, that's, that's a way of saying that I, I, on these issues of incredible diversity of opinions, and deeply, deeply held beliefs. It is not a mark of our communion to split over that. I would rather not see resolutions of that type. Well, there will be resolutions, Bishop Eugene, that oh, it is okay. very clear, it's a call. but would you, would you rather not see calls yeah. on it either? Yeah. It's, it's a call for, and I understand the reason for it, but um, again, and as I put in the chat, that is not the purpose of communion. I do not believe, I, I think it is a mistake to go down that road. Bishop Emma? Yes, I think I'd want to say, I mean, this whole study document will be published and people will probably hone in on the, the one paragraph that you've just quoted from. I think that's inevitable. So just to say a few things, I hope um, they don't, because there's some really good stuff in the whole of that study guide. Um, a few things to say, that one paragraph is part of a call which is all about the whole area of human dignity. And it does need to be read in full and it does need to be read in context. There is quite a call there um, to really uphold the human dignity of everyone. The, 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 the restatement of Lambeth 110 is a, is a restatement of fact. It, it is the, the mind of the community, certainly the mind of the majority of the communion. Um, if you take sort of numerical majority, it, it is the, the stated view of the, the majority of the communion. But it mentions Lambeth 110 in its entirety, which is not just about um, marriage between a man and a woman. It is also about the dignity of LGBT people and the full welcome and inclusion of LGBT people. And we often forget that bit of Lambeth 110. We just focus on, on the first bit. So that bit is restated as well. Just a very quick one to Bishop Eugene. It's just interesting what you're saying about not rather not seeing those resolutions on sexuality, I wonder whether you and the um, other bishops from the US and from Canada uh, will be resisting that resolution and looking to, to, to change that in any way or, or just to not to, not to uh, sign that or, or not to approve that in any way. I wonder what your response will be. I'm not going to, uh, I cannot speak for the other bishops of the Episcopal Church, um, but obviously uh, ours is one of the provinces that uh, we are in an, um, a minority position on that issue of human sexuality. I know what it's like to be a minority in a number of different ways. I just make a plea for my brothers and sisters who have the majority opinion 
to keep me in the room, keep us in the room, be in the room with us, um, and don't kick us out. Be in the room with us and let us explain what the dignity of every human being means in our context. The Anglican Consultative Council is being called on to look at the whole area of justice around um, gender and sexuality. I think I, I hope you called that. I think that's where I got to. And I was saying that these are discussion documents. They, so bishops will have the opportunity to add their voice to these calls um, at the conference and to, to shape them together. So they're not the, the last word. Um, I, do we need a call on this? Well, I think the fact that probably 80% of our call this morning has been dominated by this topic, then yes, Maybe probably, not quite that much. <laughs> not, not quite, it is a topic that Anglicans are talking about and are yeah. concerned about. So um, I think if we were not to have something on this, that would cause more comment. Yeah. Thank you very much indeed. Um, we've got a message from um, Bishop um, Joseph Wandera apologising for not being able to join us after all this morning. It would have been lovely to have heard from him. Um, but it is one o'clock and it is time for a cold drink. I'd like to thank um, you all for joining us, um, especially Bishop Eugene, Bishop Emma, Bishop Anthony and Bishop Sammy. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, and uh, we wish you um, an enjoyable and I think, given that I'm a journalist, eventful conference. Thank you very much.